Dobro večer, poštovani gledalci. Gledate spoljnopolitički magazin Protokol. Večeras u nešto drugačijem izdanju. Gost protokola je šejh Imran Nazar Hosein, ugledni islamski teolog i filozof. Good evening and welcome. Thank you, Daniel. You drew attention to your lectures here in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the region after you claim that in Srebrenica was not a genocide but a horrible massacre. That was a pretty bold statement. Can you please elaborate your claim? It was not a bold statement, Daniel. It was the truth. By my definition of what constitutes genocide, let me define genocide. Genocide would be the mass killing of a people conducted by another people. A definition of genocide would be when the European peoples migrated to the New World, uh, to the United States and Canada. They met a American Indian people out there. And the American Indians were slaughtered like cockroaches. Um, there is a term that they use for it because they don't like the word genocide, so they call it ethnic cleansing. Well, there was nothing clean about it. It was dirty. This was genocide. The European people who went to the New World, the Western Hemisphere, did not, as a community, condemn it. There were no powerful voices raised against it. Rather, they supported it, and they profited from it. That was genocide. Did that happen at Srebrenica? Did the Orthodox Christian people of this region support what happened with Srebrenica? Were they happy about the massacre of Muslims? Did they rejoice over about it? Did they profit from it? Did they celebrate it? Are they still up to this day happy about it? No. No. The Serbian people and the rest of the Orthodox Christians of this region are not happy about what happened. They condemn what happened. They uh, would rather find out who are the ones who are responsible for it. And I don't think, Daniel, that we have as yet the full story. I think there are parts of the story which are hidden. And if anyone has the knowledge of it and tries to reveal it, he might be killed. Like anyone who knows about the truth of 9-11 and tries to reveal it, he'll be killed. That's their methodology. So too I am saying, Daniel, that there are parts of this story which have not as yet been revealed. The hidden hands at work. To try to have an event that will fulfill, allow them to fulfill their larger political and military agenda. I'm talking about NATO. I'm talking about the uh, Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance which rules most of Western Europe and North America. And uh, it would be beneficial if the Orthodox Christian people of this region were to call for a commission of inquiry which is given legal power and mandated to pursue the subject and let us get the full story of what happened at Srebrenica. And at that time, we'll then be able to know who were responsible for it. But at this time, we already know that by and large, the Orthodox Christian people of this region do not support it. That therefore does not qualify as genocide. This is my definition of genocide. But people start defining and using words differently all the time to suit their own vocabulary. Once upon a time, I could use the word gay, something nice, gay. Now I use the word gay, it has another meaning. So too, genocide used to be something else. Now today, this is genocide. So don't play games with words. This is why I have come forward to say, no, this was not a genocide. But I have something more to say. There was a sinister agenda at work, not only in Srebrenica, when the full story comes up,
But there was a sinister agenda, agenda at work in the Security Council of the United Nations. The Quran, which is the only absolute authority in Islam, not the government of Turkey, and most certainly not the Prime Minister of Turkey, it is the Quran which is this absolute authority as to what is Islam. And the Quran has spoken plainly and clearly about a Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for Muslims in the end time. My understanding, the end time. The Quran has identified these Christian people and I have in several of my lectures, I don't need to repeat it today. All of Bosnia knows my views. I identify them with the Orthodox Christians. If you say I am wrong, then tell me who is right. Tell me if it's Washington, or tell me if it's London, or Bos or Bonn, or Paris, the ones that you worship. That's your Kibla, it's not mine. If I am right that there is going to be love and affection between Orthodox Christians and Muslims, according to the Qur'an. And this is to come to pass. Then my heart is in the right place. I have come to Belgrade to try to build friendship and affection and understanding and cooperation between Orthodox Christians and Muslims. Am I wrong in doing that? Which fool with a capital F will say that I am wrong in doing that. Well then, if that resolution had been adopted in the Security Council, you could have said goodbye forever and ever and ever to any possibility of friendship and reconciliation between Muslims and Orthodox Christians in this part of the world, despite 500 years of Ottoman oppression. In one of your lectures, also, you said that behind the politics that claims that in Srebrenica was uh, committed a genocide are the very same institutions who allowed that massacre to happen. Can you be more spe specific? What institutions? It is, when, it is when we have a commission of inquiry to pursue the truth to its very end, that the evidence will come out. At this time, if there is someone who has crucial evidence, you know, it's called a whistleblower, and there is a threat that he might reveal the truth, they'll kill him. Many people have been killed since 9-11 in order to preserve that monstrous lie that is 9-11. <coughs> but you can connect the dots and you ask, who are those who benefited from 9-11? What happened since then? Similarly, you can look to Srebrenica and ask, who are those who benefited from it? And the answer is as plain and clear as daylight. Although I've not seen much of the sun since I came to Belgrade. The answer is plain as daylight. They have their biggest military base, other than Germany, there in Kosovo today. They have all of these countries as members of their NATO, which is the military arm of the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance. If the Muslims of that part of the world did not know it, if the Islamic scholars did not teach them, it's about time for Imran to tell them that the Book of Allah, the Quran, prohibits you from being a member of NATO. Of course, the Turkish Prime Minister doesn't know that. I don't know if he reads the Quran. The Book of Allah, the Quran, prohibits you from being a member of NATO. Where in the Book of Quran? Go and look, listen to my lectures. So the answer to your question is, you cannot provide the evidence in concrete form because they'll kill the whistleblower. The way you'll know it is to see who have benefited from Srebrenica. And the answer is very clear and plain, NATO has benefited. I guess you are aware of that, but after your lectures about Srebrenica uh, and your advice to Muslims to cooperate closer with the Orthodox Christians, 
Your popularity among Bosnian Muslims a little bit decreased. What do you make of that? I'm not surprised. When Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, made a truce with the uh, people of Mecca who were fighting him. It was called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Not one of his followers agreed with him. They didn't like the treaty. One of the articles of the treaty required that the animals of sacrifice which had been brought were to be sacrificed right there in Hudaybiyah, but not in Mecca, as is normally done. And when the Prophet asked, asked them to do the sacrifice, they refused. None of them was prepared to do it. So I'm not surprised with the response from Bosnia, but I'm not disheartened, no. One of the wives of the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, said to him, you do the sacrifice. And so he took the knife and he made the sacrifice of the animal. And then after that, all the rest came. That's why I'm here in Belgrade. I'm doing similar, following the sunnah of the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him. I'm not a prophet. I'm following his sunnah. So I'm here in Belgrade. My popularity may have declined out there, but that's not permanent. When I came to Belgrade, I lectured yesterday at the state, at the University of Belgrade before a packed auditorium and the response I got from that audience was kind and respectful and affectionate and loving. And so I say this is a good beginning. Uh, you offered, that was something unusual, apologies to Orthodox Christians for the atrocities committed against uh, them during the Ottoman Empire. Why do you think that apologies are necessary now? True religion has zero tolerance for oppression. Whether it is Judaism, or Christianity, or Islam, or any other religion which claims to have truth. I don't think any Jew will differ with me. The true religion has zero tolerance for oppression. The Ottoman Empire was an oppressor with a capital O. It said that it was waging a jihad against the Christians. Does the Quran ask you to do that? Is it the Sunnah of the Prophet to do that? That was a bogus jihad, like ISIS today. You are waging wars of aggression. You are waging wars to oppress a people. And therefore, you must be condemned for that. That oppression continued for 600 years. And it was done in the name of Islam. That's why I have to apologize. Not only were the Christians deceived into believing that it was Islam which was victorious on the battlefield of Kosovo. That's what the Christians believed. Islam defeated us. They were deceived. No, it was not Islam. It was Gog and Magog. It was not Islam. It was Gog and Magog. And I am the scholar who's pursuing the subject of eschatology. So I do have some credentials to speak about Gog and Magog. Of course, when I make a statement, you're free to differ with me. But if I'm wrong, you must tell me what is right. Otherwise, it's arrogance. Not only did they deceive the Christians, they deceived the Muslims as well. And the Muslims believed that this was a great Islamic empire fighting jihad on the name of Islam. And all those who die killing the Christians will go to heaven. They deceived them. 
one of the reasons why they were able to deceive them was because they achieved what I thought would have been impossible. They took the capital of Islam from the Arab world and brought it to the capital city of the Orthodox Christian world. There are many strange things which have happened in history, Daniel, but I don't find anything to beat this one. To take the capital of the, of the Muslim world and bring it and pack it up in the capital of the Orthodox Christian world, and now you have credentials to speak for Islam. That's how they managed to deceive the Muslim world, that they were great representatives of Islam. Don't come to me and tell me the, the Ottoman Empire did this which was good and that which was good and that which was good. It's irrelevant. My, my statement is that the Ottoman Empire was an oppressor. Yes or no? Once it is an oppressor, it is not representative of Islam. Uh, do you think that uh, apology is necessary from the other side too? Whatever was done in the name of Islam and did not represent Islam and cause injury to others, like taking the greatest cathedral of the Orthodox Christian world, Hagia Sophia, and uh, shamefully um, transforming it and sinfully transforming it into a masjid to drive a dagger into the heart of the Christian world that will bleed eternally. I have a duty to set the record straight. I have a duty to say this was shameful, disgraceful, sinful. And I have a duty to apologize on behalf of Islam. In doing so, I'm setting an example. And I hope I'm not doing it in any way condescendingly or arrogantly. I'm setting an example. It is not for me to turn to the Orthodox Christian world, my brothers, to say you were wrong in doing this and you were wrong in doing that and you did this which is wrong. No. It is for my brother, the Orthodox Christian, and he is my brother. It is for him to look at his record and see what are those things which are done on, in the name of Christianity which were not representative of Christianity and denounce them rather than me doing it. I would like to switch to the geopolitics, if you don't mind, right now. Uh, do you believe that uh, Arab Spring, a series of revolution in Arab world, were spontaneous? Or somebody actually wrote a script and schemes how it should happen? <laughs> it is now very plain and clear that there was a, um, an interior agenda and an exterior, exterior appearance of spontaneity, whereas there's an interior agenda which was planned, meticulously planned. That planning was done on behalf of the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, which is in Western Christianity. You know which Christianity I'm talking about? Yes, yes. The one which does not allow anyone to have a bed. No. The Lord God put the bed on the face of the face. But they say no, no bed, that Christianity. But they have one man who does have a very big beard, white beard and he has come to take over he's hijacked Jesus now and he comes once a year on a reindeer fellow called Santa Claus I'm talking about that that Christianity okay I hope Santa Claus doesn't come to Orthodox Christianity if he's come here please repatriate him that Christian world um, 
is different from this Christian world. Um, that Christian world reconciled with Judaism, not with the Semitic Jew, who is now a small minority, but with a mysterious person called a European Jew. I don't know where he came from. How could a European be a Jew? And f that reconciliation led to a Judeo-Christian alliance that the Quran speaks about and prohibits us Muslim from being friends and allies of that alliance. The binding force was Zionism. So Christian Zionists and Jewish Zionists, or Zionist Jews, established this Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance. That alliance has NATO as its military arm to do its dirty work for it. The alliance knows that they have to wage war on Egypt and that Israel has to wage war in order to expand its territory to encompass the biblical frontiers of the Holy Land, which is from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Our sources declare that to be false. That is not the frontiers of the Holy Land, but it's there. When Israel wages that war to take the eastern delta of Egypt, you need more than aerial warfare, naval warfare, you need land warfare. As they say, you need boots on the ground. <laughs> but Egypt has about 80 million people. How are you going to do it? The answer is you need NATO on one side and Israel on the other side so that Egypt would be sandwiched. So while there was the appearance of spontaneity in the ex external manifestation of the Arab Spring, there was internal planning to get NATO to take control of Libya, and that's what has happened. Thanks to these fools who went and waged their CIA jihad. They need Syria. They absolutely need Syria. If they have Syria, they'll have Nick Lebanon like that in their grip. And Israel will then be able to wage a big war, and it'll be like a cruise, easy for them. That's the internal planning. That leads us to the question. You mentioned earlier ISIS. What is your opinion about ISIS, about its origins and goals? We always knew that those who were waging uh, the so-called jihad, whatever be the name they had, and the names are always changing, you know, like musical chairs. Yesterday we were hearing about something called Al-Qaeda. Well, I've been along for, I never heard the name. I'm 73 years of age. Where did this come from? Al-Qaeda. And it took control of all the airways and so on, all the media. And now something else, and tomorrow something else. So you know they keep on changing names, but it's the same people all the time. So where are they getting their weapons from? <laughs> Who is funding them? We always knew the external appearance they wanted to be accepted was one of a valid jihad. The internal reality was that it was still these wicked people in the CIA and the Israeli Mossad and the British intelligence and so on, who were not only doing the planning, but also the funding and providing the weapons and doing the training and so on. Lo and behold, when Russia intervened, suddenly we're hearing voices. Oh, but you're not attacking ISIS. You're attacking our boys. Oh, okay. So now the evidence is coming out that the CIA is now admitting that they were funding and they were training and they were arming and they were providing the weapons for the opposition to, to Assad in Libya, I mean in Syria. So now we can legitimately declare it's a CIA jihad. But I have a better name for it. 
for ISIS and company. I call it the Yankee Jihad. <laughs> Uh, Russian intervention in Syria changed the balance of power uh, in that war right now. Do you see the end of the conflict and how will Syria and the entire Middle East uh, look at its end? This is where Christian eschatology and Islamic eschatology has to take over and help political science. <laughs> yes, I am myself, myself a student of international politics and international economics and so on. Uh, so I know the subject, but I tell you, uh, the tools of political analysis are inadequate. You need eschatology. And uh, Christian eschatology and Islamic eschatology has to come together and interact with each other because there's that in Christian eschatology which we don't have, and there's that in Islamic eschatology that you don't have. So I, I have to learn. Mm -hmm. I have to listen. I have to benefit mm -hmm. from Christian eschatology. And I hope that the Christian will also want to listen and learn from what I have to offer in Islamic eschatology. The eschatological uh, perspective that we bring uh, allows us to recognize that we are now located at a moment in the historical process. Uh, which is a moment of transition from, in the same way there was transition from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana. We are now in transmission, transition from Pax Americana to something which is to come after it. We recognize it to be Pax Judaica. Pax means peace, but there's nothing peaceful about it. There's only blood and lies. <laughs> So the name Pax is a misnomer. This so-called Pax Judaica is to replace Pax Americana, which is why the US dollar is now in irreversible decline, which is why the United States has a power in the world. The ruling state is now in irreversible decline. And uh, we recognize that in order for Pax Americana to replace Pax Britannica, not only was there a requirement for change in the monetary system, with the British pound giving way to the US dollar, but great wars had to be fought. First World War and Second World War. Millions had to die. Similarly, we say that in order for Pax Judaica to replace Pax Americana, you need a big, big war or wars. What we've been having so far may be defined as the hors d'oeuvres of the war which is to come. The eschatology in Christianity says it's Armageddon. In Islam it's called the Malhama, and all the Muslims know about it. My eschatological uh, viewpoint is that we are now approaching that big war and that it's going to be a nuclear war and the pieces are now in place. Once Russia has intervened militarily in Syria, and Russia has done that, Russia is not going to back out. Russia is not going to scale down her involvement. Once Russia has intervened, the NATO uh, opponent has to augment his involvement. He has to come into the scene publicly, the way Russia has come into the scene publicly. And as NATO does that, Russia will respond. NATO must be first to fight Libya. Yeah. Because you can fight Libya and you can go home and have dinner. But you can't do that with Russia. The nice thing about the Muslim Christian Alliance, which supports Russia, which I'm working for, is that Muslims and Christians are not afraid to die because of our faith. If millions have to die, Daniel, in order for the oppressor to bite the dust, we don't mind dying. But those who are in the American Armed Forces because of a green card, they don't want to die. <laughs> No. 
So they're scared of nuclear war. So I don't think nu Russia wants nuclear war. But Russia is saying, we are not afraid of you. I don't think the U.S. armed forces want nuclear war because they're scared of death. But there are those who do want nuclear war. And it's time for, for Bosnia to understand that. There are those who do want nuclear war, and Bosnia knows who they are. I don't have to tell Bosnia that. They want nuclear war because they want to rule the world. They want to succeed the United States as the next ruling state. But Israel is too small. It is either that Israel must expand to become a much bigger state, to become a successor to the United States, or the world has to become smaller. Which one will it be? You know the answer, Daniel. That's why they want nuclear war. So that what is left of the world after nuclear war, Israel can easily manage to rule. And when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, then at that time, our prophet has said, at that time, a day like a week for the Jal, the, uh, the Antichrist would have come. And then after that, the Antichrist or the Jal will emerge as a human being in Jerusalem and declare he's the Messiah. This is eschatology. So yes, my answer is, we are now staring nuclear war in the fish. How do we respond? Uh, number one, do not be afraid of death. Let me, I know the Christians are not afraid of death. And I want to say to my Muslim brothers also, you must not be afraid of death. No. If death has to come, let it come. Don't run from the battlefield because you're afraid of death. If nuclear war is to come, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the godless oppressor who now a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate? Is that where your heart is? Don't you have any sense in your head? Or is your, is your loyalty to the one who is standing up to the oppressor? In the Quran, there is Zul Karnain. Karnain means two ages. A first age before Gog and Magog was released, and a second age afterwards. And in Surah al Kaf of the Quran, power in that region of the world in which the Black Sea is located, power rested on the foundations of faith and power was used to punish the oppressor. The Quran is telling us that in time to come in that same region of the Black Sea, and Daniel, you know that Crimea is in the Black Sea. Don't forget that. Crimea is in the Black Sea. In that region of the world, destiny is that power will once more rest on the foundation of faith. Even after the Bolshevik Revolution, the Jewish Bolshevik Re Revolution, even after communism, even after the Soviet Union, Russia is returning to her spiritual heart. Their heart is barbarian. That's why a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. But Russia's heart is spiritual. Can't you see that? Power is there in Russia, and they have to respect it. That power is now resting on the foundations of faith. If you don't know it, I'm telling you that. And now the world will see what is there in the Quran. That power is going to be used to punish the oppressor. So where should you be in this coming competition? You should be on the side of Russia. So I am sending a message to the Muslim world. Don't expect the American Republic of Pakistan to join with Russia, or the American Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to join with Russia. No, it is you, the people. You have to join, particularly if you are in the Russian Federation, join the Russian Armed Forces. They are buying people for ISIS with $1,000 a day. You are not people to be bought and sold. Join the Russian Armed Forces and be on this side in that coming war. And if you are a young man in Saudi Arabia, come and join the armed forces of Russia. So that what the Prophet Muhammad prophesied, 
He said that there will be an alliance between Muslims and Rome or Orthodox Christianity in the end time. That alliance will come if you join the Russian armed forces to stand up against NATO in the coming nuclear war. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the future of Islam in Europe? There will be no Europe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be no North America tomorrow. I think after nuclear war, uh, Europe and North America would not be a place where it is habitable, okay? Uh, so the future is one in which sensible people should be making hijra, migrating out of North America or migrating out of Europe. If you cannot migrate out of the country, out of that region, you should at least leave the cities and go to the remote countryside. There is a verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Isra in which Allah has spoken of the destruction of every town and city. I am beginning to reassess my understanding of the verse. That perhaps the Quran is not speaking about every single city in the world. But rather every single city which by divine guidance ought to be destroyed. Like one which permits the marriage of a man with another man, you're supposed to be destroyed. So get out of the cities, such cities, where you see the legal permission for a man to marry another man, because destruction is coming, and go to the remote countryside. The Quran says those cities which are not destroyed will be punished with terrible punishment. The punishment would be that nuclear war will disrupt supply of food, supply of water. People will be starving, no water. There'll be riots, there'll be dog eat dog. And so the message that we send, uh, while others are busy eating McDonald's hamburgers, our message is we have a little time left. My feeling, and I hope I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, Daniel. I don't think we have more than one year left before nuclear war. Let me say it one more time. I hope and I pray I'm wrong. But if it is to come because of dreams which I have had, then you have a little time left. Get out of the cities because even if you are not destroyed in the nuclear war, there'll be no food there'll be no water. And you will be responsible for the suffering of your wife and your children at that time. So go to the remote countryside and go to places where you can produce your own food and where there's a supply of water. That's the future for Europe, whether you're Muslim or you're not. And I would like to end with, uh, with your opinion about uh, is Samuel Huntington right? Can these two civilization, Christian and Islamic, coexist? Tell Samuel Huntington for me that it would be beneficial for him to take a little time to read the Quran. Because something spectacular is taking place in the world that he doesn't know about something with enormous strategic implications is taking place in the world now, despite Samuel Huntington. And that is that two civilizations are coming closer to each other, not clash. And uh, tomorrow Bosnia will wake up. Tomorrow Albania will wake up. They love me. Yes, they love me. And they feel puzzled by my views on genocide, on Srebrenica. But tomorrow they will wake up because they love the Quran. And they know that I am teaching the Quran. And what is in the Quran must come to pass. In Spanish they say, que sera, sera. And in your language they say, sta bude bridge. Ah, sta bude bridge. It will come to pass. These two civilizations, the Christian and the Muslim, are coming closer together. And the Quran has said, 
You will be the closest in love and affection to us. So tell Samuel Huntington, take a little time to read the Quran. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Poštovani gledalci, bilo je to sve za večeras. Toliko za protokola za ovu nedelju. Vidimo se ponovo za sedam dana. Pretplati se na novu Open Big Box videoteku i uživaj neograničeno u više hiljada časova TV serija, filmskih klasika i Disneyvi crtića dostupnih pritiskom na dugme. Kad god to želiš i koliko puta želiš, bez prekida reklamama, ne popusti i popust na Open Pretplatu sa gratis razgovorima prema MTS fiksnoj mreži u Srbiji. Pored toga odaberi i novi Samsung TV na rate. Više od televizije. Enfil Open. Otvoreno za sve. Imamo veliko dvorište, kuću na sprat. Iza kuće sve prateće objekte, štalu i vočnjak sa dva hektara šljive savke. Čovjek bi rekao malo li je. Pravo da vam kažem i nije malo, mada može to puno bolje. To će tek da vrijedi. Jedino uknjižena imovina je vrijedna imovina. Odazovi se našem pozivu za izlaganje i uknjiži svoju nepokretnost potpuno besplatno. Uknjiženo vrijedi više. Republička uprava za geodetske imovinsko-pravne poslove Republike Srpske. Kupite svoju kartu za biznis prve klase. Poslujte sa novim MBS tarifama sa neograničenim razgovorima prema fiksnim mrežama u BIH, neograničenim SMS-om i mobilnim internetom uz dodatne bonus minute za pozive prema Srbiji. A iz bogate ponude izaberite jedan od atraktivnih uređaja za 1 KM. Entel. Imate prijatelje.